it's because when we were um, vlogging on YouTube, mm -hmm. the live events, it was not on the channel. Uh, we had to be on the right. Uh -huh. We had to go to the, you know where you log out? We had to write down. Uh, if you were on zero subscribers, not inside the channel, we have you logged in just for some reason. Oh. I can show you so if it happens again.
So it's um it's already working. You can hear the tapping. Um, you can throw it if you want to be uh, to have a dynamic event. Or okay, so that's, that, that's yes. the microphone. This is the microphone. And the other one is also connected. Would you like to have two microphones I activated? Because yes. I will, I can get the technical assistant to. Yeah, that will be good because I okay. think the room is quite full, and, and so we don't have to keep absolutely no that's okay it's our pleasure of the assistance here so i'll let them know and um, when you throw it there is no static So I will leave it to you both <laughs> for the uh, distribution of the, the, the mics. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, no, that's, that's Wireless microphones uh, as well as the stand. I mean, okay. stand. Yeah. Not that the beginning is like the third speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, uh, friends. Welcome. Uh, my name is Hartog Porkerson. Patricia is trying to tell me that I'm sick. I'm not. It <laughs> sounds worse than it is. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome you all here. Uh, and I, uh, Sorry. I'm very happy to welcome you all here. Uh, and. Uh, I was going to be starting to uh, underline the importance of uh, legislation for effective implementation of the Paris Agreement. But I think if you are not convinced, maybe you wouldn't be in this room. Uh, I think people are uh, focusing very much on uh, that reality because the action is now moving to the national level because that's the whole idea. Um, the Paris Agreement is there to enable, uh, to uh, focus and to uh, um, bring results but those results have, uh, are delivered at the national level. So this event is very much about uh, that and also about new tools that are available to you for developing your climate-related uh, or climate-relevant uh, legislation at home. And, and so the whole idea is to assist countries in actually building that legal foundation, uh, learning from others, uh, learning from best practice, learning even from things that have proven to be difficult, and not as uh, um, important, uh, not bringing the results that one expected. And uh, as you will see from this, uh, the structure of the event, um, uh, you will first, uh, we will be hearing from the Gratham Research Institute on climate change and environment from at the London School of Economics. And then we will also hear from uh, the UN environment and, uh, and the com uh, jointly with the Commonwealth Secretariat. And, uh, and then we move to, so that's looking at this more from an aggregate perspective, but then we zero in on, on two examples. Uh, looking at it, both we'll be hearing from uh, the Secretary General of the Inter-Parliamentary Union, and we will be hear hearing from uh, an implementer working on the ground uh, on implementation 
in Peru. But before all of this, I'm delighted to uh, uh, introduce uh, 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 Patricia Espinosa, the Executive Secretary of the Climate Change Secretariat. She is with us now and, uh, and will share her thoughts on this important topic uh, before we uh, uh, engage uh, deep, more deeper, deeply in the substance. Patricia, you have the floor. Thank you, Haldor. Thank you for all of you to for being here today. It is really encouraging to see um, such a full room uh, on a topic that I believe is uh, really very important for uh, the transformation of uh, our communities that we need and that uh, had not so um, specifically been covered in previous occasions. So I, um, I do want to start by thanking, of course, the Secretary General of the International Parliamentary Union for having come and to, to share a his experience and also what uh, the IPU is doing in this regard. I want to also thank UN Environment, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and also, of course, our Secretariat staff for organizing this event, um, which started um, the idea of this event started uh, uh, some months ago when I had the pleasure of going to the London School of Economics and making a conference. And then we were, uh, our colleagues there shared with us uh, the important work that they were doing in, in integrating a database on national laws. And uh, the idea came up there. Um, very spontaneously, why don't you come and share this with all the people that are going to be participating in the May sessions in Bonn. So I'm really very, very grateful that not only we could uh, realize this, um, um, uh, this presentation here, but also put together this uh, side event, which I think is uh, very, very interesting and important. And uh, I, I really regret that I won't be able to stay here for the whole uh, event, and I want to apologize to all of you for that uh, also from the beginning. So I, I thank all the high-level representatives from these organizations and others who are here today. This discussion brings together the think tanks that are studying legislation and developing legislative tools and the parties and parliamentarians who can use these resources. The report on climate change laws of the world launched today by the Grantham Research Institute shows that there are more climate related laws than ever before. This demonstrates that the world is building the legal framework that enables and accelerates implementation of the Paris Agreement. And this trend must be strengthened. When the landmark Paris Agreement entered into force last November, this rapid ratification already signaled that action would swift to the country level as each nation puts together policies to fulfill their contribution to the agreement. For effective implementation, climate lawmaking is indeed essential. Effective legislation regulatory and institutional measures are needed. We need new laws and we need to review existing laws and we need to fill some gaps. Overarching climate change legislation guides development and policy and practice in areas such as energy, transport, agriculture, land use and forestry, taxation, trade, security and disaster risk management, which are fundamental areas for growth. Climate change must be considered in these areas for a truly integrated approach to the challenge. Reviewing and reforming existing laws to consider climate change proactively addresses climate risks. This work must involve all ministries as all sectors of the economy and society are indeed at risk from climate change. 
with the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the Paris Agreement, every country's legal structure must now point to the goals and aspirations enshrined in these agreements. The resources we will discuss today should enable governments to explore how their own legal structure can be transformed to help achieve these common goals. Parties need a good overview and access to the climate laws and regulations that are increasing worldwide, what they are and what they can accomplish. I encourage you to look at the resources presented today with a focus on how they can apply to implement your own national contribution to the Paris Agreement. I encourage the international institutions and stakeholders today to bring their experiences to the table, to connect the dots and make the links that bring the potential of effective laws to life in the real world and the real economy. And I pledge the support of the Climate Change Secretariat in this effort. We are pleased to partner with UN Environment, with the Commonwealth Secretariat, with partner countries, with the International Parliamentary Union, to develop a toolkit on law and climate change. This, as part of a host of resources available, will provide a platform for practical use of the growing amount of legislative experience worldwide and make this information more accessible. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, momentum to meet the climate challenge continues to grow. We must speed up and scale up this momentum. Now is the momentum to turn commitment into action. And this event shows that legislators, parliamentarians and policymakers are acting. But it also shows that there is a lot more to be done. Now is the moment to push for for even stronger and more effective laws. Climate change legislation puts us on the path to the vision outlined in the Paris Agreement. It's a step towards a development model that is sustainable, where opportunity is open to all and peace and prosperity can flourish. I do thank you all for uh, being here, for your commitment, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Patricia, for, for setting the scene and, and putting this into the, con into the broader context and uh, underlining the importance of, uh, of this effort. And we will uh, now turn to uh, a, a presentation by Alina. Um, I've, I've always had, uh, had a, a problem with her last name, so I will focus on her first name. <laughs> Maybe we can have this event on a first name basis. And um, so Alina is a, a, is a principal research fellow and leads on the governance and legislation uh, work at Gratham Research Institute. And we are very happy that she is able to come here and present to us their findings. Alina, you have the floor. Thank you, Halder. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to present here today the work that we've been doing at the Grantham Research Institute. We're very excited today to launch a new online resource, an expanded online resource in partnership with the Sabian Center on Climate Change Law at Columbia University and with the generous support of the British Academy. This new resource aims at policymakers, legislators, judges, and also policy analysts around the world. Next, please. Um, and uh, what we hope it will do is to help policymakers and legislators um, understand that they're not alone in acting on climate change. It will also help them understand what policy instruments are available to address climate change, where they have been applied around the world, and uh, basically to facilitate cross-learning. This work builds on several years of experience. Um, um, we've been developing this um, resource over the past six years, and previously we have covered 99 countries. Today we're excited to cover 65 countries more. So now we are 
covering 164 countries around the world with uh, 1,200 climate change and climate change related laws and executive policies. And that covers over 95% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I will, in the next uh, 10 minutes, I will go very quickly through the online resource and then I will highlight some of the trends that we draw from it. We will have another event in, in a few weeks time where we will walk you through um, the tool itself, uh, the resource itself uh, through the webinar. So basically this is the main interface through which you can see um, how, how the resource is structured. You can choose different regions, countries, also time frames. You can also search the database by income group. You can, for example, look what high income countries or low income countries specifically have done. And this year, we're very excited to include LDCs as well in our data set. And um, <coughs> next, please. Then for each of the countries, for example, here we have example of Kenya. You can either search for the country map or for a country name. You will then get the country profile um, outlining the income group, the greenhouse gas emissions, and some of the other key indicators and also the key laws and policies related to climate change that that country has um, put in place. So, for example, if we continue with Kenya, you will then see that Kenya has adopted Climate Change Act in 2016, and for 99 of the countries, by clicking on, on the law, you will get an English language summary of that law, the key points. We have not yet been able to do it for all of the 164 countries, but hopefully in the future, this will be possible. Next, please. In addition to climate change laws and policies, this year, thanks to collaboration with the Saving Center, we are also able to cover climate change related court cases. Uh, we uh, have looked specifically at those which are outside of the United States, because the United States uh, court cases are covered by the related database, which the Sabin Center is hosting. But our, um, our resource here has looked at uh, over 250 climate-related court cases and 25 jurisdictions outside of the United States. And by clicking on, on those, you will get the summary of the case. The status, for example, here we have the ongoing case with Orkenda Foundation. You will see that the appeal is pending, the country where it's getting, and who are the principal um, uh, parties in, in the court case. So this, this is... Um, next, please. Now, um, this is just a preview. There are many more, uh, there are many more types of uh, searches you can do with the database. You can look at what countries have adopted carbon trading, for example, emissions trading, carbon tax, which countries have <coughs> energy efficiency policies in place, and pull them up and actually see. Um, but I, I just wanted to give you some highlights here. Now, on the basis of this resource, we have been able to run some analysis, and here are the highlights. The copies of the report will be available outside after this event, and also online. Um, next, please. So what we can see is in 1997, at the time of the adoption of the Kyoto Protocol, there were about 60 climate-related laws in the world. Uh, next, please. If we look at what's, what we have now, um, this is 100 and, uh, 1,200 that I have mentioned before, and the geography of where those laws are being adopted is much wider. Actually, most of the countries at the moment have some sort of climate change related laws or policies. If we look at the growth of the legislative activity over time, we can see that um, activity has been growing year on year. And in particular from around uh, 2005, there have been a surge of climate change action in developing countries in particular. Next, please. Um, however, it's not just about climate change law which specifically aims at climate change. It's also about related agenda items. So it's, it's about energy. So this slide shows the, the growth in the law, and laws that are related to low carbon transition in the energy sector. Specifically, we look at renewable energy and energy efficiency. We can also see the growth in activity in forestry sector. 
And very importantly, mainstreaming of climate change into development policy. That is also something that we have picked in our database. However, um, the annual growth in legislation has been the highest up to 2014, 2015. We have seen less laws being adopted annually in the last few years, but we think that is because countries now are moving to uh, implement the, the basis that they have legislated uh, previously. Uh, key developments since Paris, um, the previous one, please. Um, so what we see since the Paris Agreement, there have been 14 new laws and 33 executive policies introduced since the Paris Agreement. 18 of those specifically focus on climate change and interestingly, four directly reference NDCs. So we are seeing kind of trickling down of the Paris Agreement into domestic action very directly. And uh, very encouragingly, all, all LDCs, almost all LDCs address climate change in their legislation policies. And this is something we have looked at for the first time in this year. However, more work still needs to happen in terms of linking climate change to the development agenda. So at the moment, about 40% of LDCs have done that, but um, more still needs to be done. Next, please. In terms of court action, what can we say from the data that we have looked at? Um, the, the, the chart here shows the distribution of the types of court cases. And a very interesting one for us, for this audience in particular, is court cases which relate to legislation and to policies. Um, so we have 20 such cases, most of which were adopted since 2008, peaking at the time of 2015. And what those cases are aiming to do, they are either keeping the government accountable to the commitments that they have made or push for great ambition. So this is a new trend and we can expect that trend to grow now that countries move to implement Paris Agreement. Next one. So to conclude, I think uh, what our experience has been that this resource um, is, uh, is very useful and important in understanding what countries are doing around the world and learning from each other. So the next step, what we now want to do is also look at the institutional aspects. How are countries organizing themselves at the national level in terms of their key ministries, um, legislature and other actors uh, to implement Paris Agreement and to implement legislation that they have put in place. Secondly, we definitely need more analysis to understand what has actually worked in practice, what has been effective, uh, and in what circumstances. And that is still an analytical gap that we need to fill. And finally, we need to strengthen collaboration between this community, negotiators, policy makers, NGOs, and legislators to have a dialogue and exchange, um, and exchange experiences. Um, last one, please. So I will conclude with this one and, uh, and just say that, you know, while we've compiled this resource, we really very much welcome contributions from all of you. And this is the email address for providing such contributions. If we have missed some important development, policy development in your country, please let us know. If something new is coming up, please let us know as well. And finally, on June 5th, we will run a detailed session on how to use the resource. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selina, and uh, I encourage you to uh, um, look at this uh, online searchable database. And uh, the, the full link of it is, uh, is contained in the report that Alina was, uh, was, was referring to. And uh, perhaps when we get to the discussion, it will be interesting to uh, look at this integration with development and, uh, and what climate legislation really is in terms of uh, how it relates to other aspects of legislation. And because climate change is, uh, is really uh, so integrated into policy making or needs to be integrated into policy making across all sectors. So thank you very much for this. Um, we will have another tool now presented to us. And uh, this is a, uh, will come through uh, a, a joint uh, presentation from UN Environment and from the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat. And uh, is, we'll be helping uh, assisting countries to assess their legislation and institutional arrangements and the needs related to this. 
And uh, so I understand, Maria, will you go first or? Yeah, okay, so Maria, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Haldor, and good afternoon to everyone. I'll stand up at the end just so I can see other people. Um, I am Maria Socorro Mangiat from the Law Division of UN Environment, um, and I'm going to set the scene before Stephen from the Commonwealth Secretariat makes the presentation on the toolkit. Um, you might know that UN Environment has had a long tradition of assisting countries in translating internationally agreed environmental priorities into national legislation. So even before the Paris Agreement was adopted, we were already thinking about how after its adoption we could help countries. The, the normal model used by UN Environment is to create model legislation, to uh, produce guidebooks, um, and to develop decision trees in partnership with many organizations, both intergovernmental and non-governmental, and as well as governments. But it was very clear from the way the structure of the Paris Agreement was developing that these traditional tools would not work. Uh, we have nationally determined contributions, and therefore it was clear that whatever tool would be developed had to adjust to this um, new nature uh, of the contribution. Uh, why then did we decide um, to develop in partnership with the Commonwealth Secretariat and the UNFCCC Secretariat an online toolkit that Stephen will refer to? Um, it's for several reasons. One is uh, last year, many groups got together. We started talking about legal preparedness for the Paris Agreement, and it became clear that so much was going on in this area. And so definitely, we were not to start from scratch, and we had to find a way to work together and to bring everything together. So that's one. And the second is the nature of the challenge. As Stephen will show, um, climate legislation can be defined very broadly, and climate legislation has so many links to other areas of the law, as Patricia mentioned. And so an online interactive tool, building also on some of the existing databases and supplementing that, was seen by partners as the best way then to go forward. Um, and on the last point, um, what do we want out of this side event? Uh, just to just unlike the uh, Grantham Institute's database, our website has not yet been built. But we're going to show you some um, shots, mock-ups of what we think this website might look like. Because what we really want at this stage is feedback from you on whether the design that we are thinking of will help you. And if it doesn't work, then let us know and give us some suggestions on how it might work. But we just want to start from a concrete platform, and that's why we're going to show you some pretty pictures of what it might look like. <coughs> and of course, if you try to imagine what the potential and the structure of this tool will be, while we do have some seed funding for launching something hopefully by November, uh, we would welcome contributions, of course, in kind and financially. So we'd be happy to talk to you afterwards as well. So, and on that note, uh, before I hand over to Stephen, I ought to say that in connection to the climate um, litigation database that the Grantham Research Institute has developed, we also developed with the Sabin Center a report on climate litigation. Uh, which will be available um, later in the week. So we will let you know once that publication is available. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Maria, and um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, as Maria mentioned, um, what I'm going to do now is just to give you a bit of a walk through um, what we imagine the toolkit might look like. Um, I do emphasize these are, are mock-ups at the moment, um, and as Maria mentioned, we, we very much value your thoughts and input. Um, it's envisaged the toolkit will consist of four components. Um, these are not intended to be prescriptive, but rather to serve as a source of methodologies, of collections of good practice, and of knowledge sharing. Um, we know there's a lot out there already, the excellent resource from the Grantham Institute, amongst other works um, as well. Uh, and we want to build on that and to develop the toolkit in a collaborative way uh, with countries, with international organizations, non-governmental organizations, um, and academia. So the toolkit would consist of four main components, the comparative legislation platform, um, which already exists, and we will be building on those, and I'll, I'll brief you about that. Um, but two major new components, um, a methodology for climate legislation assessment, 
and a collection of lessons learned in climate legislation, as well probably as a database of ongoing legislation projects and technical assistance um, contexts. Uh, the legislation database is a, a prerequisite to the platform, to the toolkit functioning, um, because if we're going to talk about assessment questions for climate legislation or we're going to talk about lessons learned, we need to have the back-end knowledge of what is there already in national laws. And of course, many of those databases exist at the moment um, in the form of the Grantham database, in the form of Ecolex, FAOLex uh, for food and agriculture, and Urban Lex, as well as some work by, by Legal Atlas. And the toolkit would not attempt to reproduce those in any way, but it would draw from them. Um, we need to examine how that will work, but it would likely be that we would be able to draw from the combined knowledge of all of those legislation platforms in order to inform the subsequent steps um, in the tool. So let's look at the main components of the tool, the first of which would be the legislation assessment. And this would be a methodology to support countries to put in place legal frameworks that support their climate aims um, as expressed, for example, within their NDCs. Uh, and that is envisaged to be um, a guided sequential process which would help countries to identify strengths, gaps, and opportunities for reform across a wide range of thematic laws. And we're not just talking here about overarching climate change laws, but we're talking about laws in all of these different areas, in tax law, in planning law, forestry, coastal, uh, transport, and energy. And the process would start by users entering in a profile for themselves. Whilst the toolkit will be a public open source tool, the idea is that you would be able to set your own profile so that you could save the results um, of the work that you were doing with the tool. So you would enter your country and, uh, and your contact details. The next stage is that it would be important for the tool to understand the context in which um, the work is being done. And that would include both the country context in terms of legal systems and cultures. We have civil law systems, common law systems, Islamic law systems. In some countries, legislation can set out duties for ministries or provide for coordination responsibilities between ministries. In other countries, that's not normally done by law. It's more done by policy and executive decree. So it's important to understand the legal system in which the tool um, will operate. It's also important, of course, to understand climate vulnerabilities of a particular country context and greenhouse gas emission profiles. But more than that, we envisage that the tool could also learn about and understand priorities. So the user may be able to enter in climate priorities as expressed in their NDCs to inform the tool that energy or development of renewable energy in their country was a particular priority. And all of this information, it is envisaged, would inform the steps that the tool would support the user to go through afterwards. The user may then wish to undertake a review or assessment of the legislation in their country. And we would like to review and classify the laws according to key areas under the Paris Agreement, including governance, adaptation, finance, technology, capacity building, and measuring, reporting, verification, or, or transparency. And we think that laws could be grouped accordingly under these different areas. So, for example, under mitigation, energy would be a key theme. The user may then wish to zoom down into um, energy efficiency. But more than that, it would go through a sequential level um, of classification. So the tool could ask about energy efficiency vis-a-vis -vis product accountability, vis-a-vis -vis import and export, vis-a-vis -vis building standards. And the tool would guide the user through all of these questions to see whether these particular elements of this sub-theme are captured within the national law. At the end of that, the user would come to an assessment result. And the assessment result, again, would not be determinative, but it would likely consist of a self-reflection, a reflection back to the user of the answers that they had given, a summary of their answers with possible areas for reform highlighted, and linking to the next component of the tool, which is the lessons learned. 
So as has been mentioned a number of times, legislation by itself is, is not sufficient. And of course, countries must implement legislation and must use it to bring about the change that is required. And we envisage that the tool could capture those lessons learned from the national perspective. So within an area such as overarching climate change laws, the tool may look at elements such as does the law deal with a national um, greenhouse gas budget? Does it deal with greenhouse gas accounting? Does it establish a coordinating entity? Does it establish trading schemes? And in each of these areas, the tool could point users to narrative lessons learned or experience of countries in how those provisions are included within their law, how they've been implemented, and what the success or importantly, the weaknesses potentially have been. There would also be a narrative link to other cross-cutting areas of law, so you could see links between laws. And of course, going back to the starting point, to the back-end legislation database, such that within each area of law, the user could look at example provisions from uh, real-life examples, informed perhaps by the information that the tool already knows about the country context. So you would not receive example provisions from laws in a country with a completely different context, but you would receive examples from countries that would have a similar context and concern to yourselves. All of this requires tagging and classification of laws at the provision level, which is a significant amount of work that the tool would add to the existing resources that are already there. We're at the stage, um, as you can see, of scoping at the moment. We're working with a number of partners, including the Grantham Institute, IPU, King's College London, um, the Climate Change Secretariat, UN Environment, UNHCR, FAO, and UN Habitat, and a number of other international organizations and non-governmental organizations. And the idea is that this tool will pull together these uh, extensive global resources to become a key go-to focal point for any country looking at climate legislation reform. Um, I thank you very much for your address and uh, give you our contact details at the end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria and, and Stephen. Um, and um, we, we will have uh, an opportunity uh, to clarify things from the, these presentations. Uh, when we move to questions and answers and, and discussion. But I'm uh, delighted to uh, welcome here the Secretary General of the uh, Interparliamentary Union. And uh, of course, laws are set by legislators. And, uh, and so I think it, it's really uh, helpful that, uh, that you're able to join us here uh, and share with us uh, your perspectives on this. Uh, and. Uh, Focusing very much on what it is that works and, and what we have learned and, and how to take this forward. Martin, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Aldo. It's a pleasure uh, to spend this day here in Bonn talking climate. Um, I, I feel like a general practitioner jumping from one thing to the other. And uh, uh, this morning, we just came from uh, press conference uh, where we launched the study that uh, has been presented by Alina, uh, which the IPU has been very uh, honored to uh, uh, co-sponsor. Um, as we discuss uh, the issues here, I think that it is important for us to be on the same page when it comes to what it is that we think Parliament should be doing. Yes. Uh, in implementation of Paris. And there, we are not asking parliaments to do the extraordinary. We are simply saying that they should use the powers that have been enshrined in the Constitution to give concrete expression at the national level to commitments entered into by uh, their governments. And legislation is one of the tools that they have it's within their powers to enact legislation to give a concrete expression to uh, Paris in this case. But you also have the oversight uh, role that parliaments have to play. It is not enough to enact legislation. It is also and equally important to make sure that that legislation is implemented. 
uh, it is important to make sure that that legislation addresses the needs of society in a very equitable uh, fashion. And also importantly, it is, it is crucial for parliaments to be able to exercise their budget allocation policies or powers effectively in order to finance all of the things that the Paris Agreement says uh, states should be doing. So if we agree that these are things that uh, Parliament should be doing, and then we look at the nature of Parliament itself, that is made up of people who actually come from society, they're living with the citizens, they're representatives of people, they have received a mandate to implement uh, uh, policy on behalf of uh, the citizens. Then we have uh, a fuller picture. There, uh, we now look at the challenges facing parliaments when it comes to this. And from our experience, we've seen that awareness is already there. Uh, parliaments are aware of the existence of uh, Paris, uh, Paris Agreement. That's just, there's no doubt about that. Regarding the details, I'm not very sure. And that is what the Interparliamentary Union is doing. Uh, when I leave here, I'm going to go to Vietnam, where on uh, Thursday and Friday, Saturday, we are bringing together some 25 parliaments in the Asia-Pacific region just to brief them on the uh, nuts and bolts of uh, Paris and look at how parliaments can address the challenges, the climate challenge. So it is important for them to be aware, but it's also important for them to understand. And that's where we have seen that there is a gap because the language of climate change is invariably intractable, as I said at the press conference. Uh, it's very technical. Yes. And so one thing that we need to be looking at is how to break down this language into something that is understandable, is digestible to the parliamentarian so that he or she can articulate policies that address the climate change uh, um, uh, challenge in a very effective manner. So, importantly so the, the tools that have been uh, mentioned uh, here that are being uh, developed and we're very keen uh, to be part of the process uh, will come in very handy so you have awareness you have promoting understanding of the issues and then uh, documentation now we've seen the comparative legislation uh, uh, platform that uh, we uh, have uh, uh, developed with uh, the Graham Institute. Uh, now, uh, I think that we should go even further. There is legislation, but then we have to develop, and I think this should come through in the tool that has been presented, the online tool. That is, look at how you assess the impact of the legislation that is in place. How is this legislation being implemented in countries? And I'm very glad you mentioned in the uh, that. Uh, a mock up there, the need for lessons learned. If you're going to uh, churn out legislation that has no positive impact on climate change, then it's useless to do this. So we should be trying to identify some good practice out there that we can now help to disseminate uh, 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 globally and you know, regionally. Um, when it comes to the IPU more uh, specifically, uh, it is important then that these tools are fed into programs of assistance to parliaments. Uh, I think it was Alina who was saying this. You had one who was saying that the entry point, no, I think it's your colleague from UN Environment who was saying the entry point is governments. Yes, governments are there uh, because, uh, well, they negotiate the treaties. But at the end of the day, at the national level, the entry point should also be parliaments because they are the people who devise this legislation. So at the national level, there should be frameworks, there should be platforms that would engage parliamentarians on uh, climate uh, change the challenge. Then we we look at uh, specific things. For us, uh, we have lessons learned. For instance, uh, parliaments, uh, parliamentarians have come to enjoy the benefit of tools such as uh, handbooks. You take, for in this particular case, uh, uh, Paris, women, and you break this down into what it is that Parliament should be doing in respect of each of the provisions. And in that way, you are building their knowledge, their knowledge base, but then you're also spurring action 
uh, for them to uh, work in this. So I, this is something that uh, I would like to see very much uh, uh, the uh, international community developing for the benefit of, uh, of Parliament. And uh, this also uh, ties in with a methodology that the Interparliamentary Union has sought to promote. You know, parliaments function in an eminently political and sensitive environment. And everything you say, everything you do, is seen through the eyes of politicians. What is in there for me? What am I going to get? How am I going to get elected through this? And then, so you, some of the things that uh, we find very obvious, uh, technically, might not be obvious to them, or they might not want to uh, have this obvious to them. And so what they do, what we try to do is to get parliaments to identify their own gaps in knowledge, with the skills, when it comes to implementing climate change. Uh, they do that, we call that self-assessment. They do it themselves, they like to do it, because then you don't, they don't have this uh, technical bureaucrats coming to breathe down their throats. You give them the, uh, uh, a menu, and they use it to uh, assess their capacity and identify gaps that we can now help them uh, free feel through legislation and others. So I think that uh, I, I'm going to uh, stop at this point because I think I, I have uh, consumed uh, uh, my time. But I thought there was one last thing. Yes, two last things very quickly. First of all, fostering synergies between parliamentarians and civil society. We have to build platforms <coughs> for this to happen. As I said at the press conference, uh, the Sometimes the two are this, uh, one and the same people. You know, the uh, parliamentarians and live with the citizens. They're part of uh, civil society groups and all like. How can we build synergies between the two? Experience shows that relations between the two at the institutional level are fraught with a lot of suspicion. And that we have to overcome that when it comes to climate change. And the last challenge is that of how parliaments deal with. Uh, uh, I would say differences within Parliament on issues of climate change. We've seen uh, the Trump administration that is uh, 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 trying to renege on some of the commitments of uh, Paris, or to all of the commitments of Paris. But at national level also, within Parliament, you have to deal with the opposition and the governing party. How do you uh, mediate between the two so that you come up with policies that reflect the views of all? Not only that, you have individual members of parliament who have specific interests because they are from the business community, they are from the civil society and scientific community. They have certain agendas that they want to push through. How do you mediate between all of this in the context of developing legislation and other action that parliament should be taking to advance uh, the climate change agenda? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, thanks for... Particularly, I appreciate you bringing up the issue of language, uh, and uh, and this is something that I think we all need to be addressing now. And you characterized yourself as a, a general practitioner, but there are so many general practitioners out there now, coming trying to come to grips with Paris, mm -hmm. and so uh, that that is really the big change uh, uh, that is that is happening. And and uh, I liked your expression of that you basically need to give concrete expression to Paris. But what is that concrete expression of Paris? And that's very much different from one country to another. So the details are actually at home. The details are not so much uh, at the international level. And this is why I'm, I'm really uh, delighted that, uh, that uh, we, we can now turn to uh, uh, Rosa to share with us. Uh, she has worked both in building the global regime, but now she's uh, uh, looking at how to take that uh, regime uh, and 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 change things at home. Uh, Rosa is the general director for uh, 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 directorate for climate change and desertification in Peru, and uh, I'm delighted to give you the floor, Rosa. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I think that the reason uh, Peru is here speaking today is because at this very moment we are having a debate on. Um, having a, a climate law, specifically a climate change law. Um, and as Haldor said, um, at this moment also, we are making or we are working on uh, delivering on our NDCs. And I say this because the law that we have proposed is 
um, precisely aimed uh, to have this implementation in place. Um, during 2014, when Peru was preparing its uh, COP, the COP in Lima, there was, of course, a lot of awareness, and it was a moment where people started first uh, uh, first started to to talk about a law. <clears throat> and coming from this debate, at um, the end of last year, we ended with three uh, proposals three projects for a climate law coming from the legislators. But uh, we, as um, the executive uh, branch of the government, we saw that these uh, three projects lack of the most important instrument that we have at this moment, uh, which is the Paris Agreement. All the provisions of the Paris Agreement were not in these three uh, projects. This is why we decided to make uh, a fourth project for the law. And I would say that this uh, project brings may maybe three main uh, provisions. The first one is that, of course, it speaks um, very directly and, and very um, uh, precise about the uh, the Paris uh, Agreement, and of course, it relates to the uh, contributions. This this new concept for the Peruvian lawmakers. Um, the second thing is that uh, it engages all the different levels of government. This means the national, the subnational, and the local um, authorities. Into, um, into the issue of climate change, but bringing um, their planning work um, with um, the issues and the, the, the consequences and the um, causes of climate change. This means mitigation and adaptation. <clears throat> um, and this uh, exercise of um, for, for these levels of governments to bring their in their planning, the issue of climate change would end in them to have uh, resources, public resources to make these actions. <clears throat> and the third um, important idea is also that this proposal that we're making brings, uh, brings uh, to the discussion and to the action the different stakeholders also. And this, of course, comes from the experience that we had with all the, the action agenda and, and how it is important and, and the awareness that we at this moment have within the civil society, the private sector, the indigenous peoples, etc. <clears throat> um, so, so at this moment, maybe tomorrow, our minister is going to go to the, to the Congress to explain the proposal that we are bringing and to have a debate with the other um, or with the legislators and with the other three uh, proposals <clears throat> we are not sure how how long this this process would take what i can say is that uh, people are um, um, aware of this and there is a lot of interest and so many um, questions come. I think that uh, maybe these this, uh, tools that you are um, uh, building would have been very useful <laughs> some months ago <clears throat> for us at oh, least. Yeah. Um, and maybe some comments to your to your tools are first one of the very uh, or, or the most important questions that we are facing is what would be the benefit for the country to have a climate law <clears throat> and uh, but i mean we can speak uh, of benefits in qualitative terms but of course, some legislators and mainly the Ministry of Economy and Finance wants to have some figures also. So maybe you should, in your in your toolkit, try to at least uh, bring this this kind of data. <clears throat> that would be very very useful. And the other thing is that um, in the first presentation, 
I, I understood that there were some, um, I mean, when you when you made your that database, you spoke of laws and policies. And I would say that these two kinds of in instruments are very different. We have had the a strategy, a na the national strategy for climate change. And of course, that instrument is very important, but it doesn't have the strength of a law. In the law, what public uh, officials have to do becomes um, uh, obligatory, right? So, and this is why all these questions arise. When the minister, when our minister was presenting the law to the president and to the other 13 ministers, or, or to, to, the, to all the ministers, but mainly the 13 ministers that are in our working group for the NDCs started asking her, what are the specific consequences in economic terms for the sector of energy, for the sector of transportation, for the sector of housing, for agriculture, etc., of having this law and of fulfilling the Paris uh, Agreement. So um, I think that you should also maybe in your uh, charts, in your figures, have also the possibility just to see you know, a, a, a division of what is the analysis only with the laws and what is the analysis only with uh, with other kinds of instruments. And I also understand that you are speaking of climate-related policies and, and for sure that must be explained somewhere. What do you refer to that? Because it depends a lot on the researcher, right? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rosa. And um, uh, we have now um, kind of kicked off this conversation, and uh, we have 30 minutes now together. And there's so much uh, wealth of, uh, of insights and, and experience in this room. And so I would want to uh, uh, see if we can combine uh, feedback from you, reflections that you might have, with uh, quite clarity, either clarification questions that you would wish to provide or suggestions like Rosa was just doing now she was providing feedback and suggestions because I know that all of the people up here uh, that made these presentations they're doing it because they wanted to be of value so uh, getting feedback from you is going to be extremely uh, uh, welcome uh, let's try to be as efficient as we can with with time because uh, so we can get as many in as possible and you know the drill, um, uh, the, the um, uh, microphone will come flying your way. Um, uh, but I, I, think it is, <laughs> I think it's important to uh, just take a moment before you make your interventions or, or, or state your uh, observations or question that you introduce yourself and, and so it helps us place you in what, what you do. And so now the floor is open and I have a, a request here and another one way in the back. So okay. we'll start here and then go all the way to the back. You have the floor. Thank you very much. One is for Rosa and the other one from the representative of UEP. Uh, for Rosa, what are the specific aspects who are included in this uh, new law who are not included in the in the Paris Agreement, because if one country already ratified by the Congress the Paris Agreement, that means that the uh, like a national law uh, in, 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 the, in the international level. And for the re representative of the Interparliamentarian Union, uh, what could be uh, a trigger for the different parliaments to attend as well the climate change uh, uh, needs in each country, because we saw that the, the people in the Congress in different countries are in another areas, but not, not taking the responsibility of uh, climate change aspects. Thank you. Thanks, and tell us who you are. Uh, Jorge Cabrera from Guatemala. Thank you. 
So uh, we will collect uh, questions and reactions, and so I will ask the panel members. Uh, so we'll only turn once to the panel. I think that's the most efficient. And so our friend in the back, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Dora Maru from South Africa, and thank you for the intriguing uh, presentation. The one question that I really want is, as you are undertaking the assessment of the various laws, what are some of the pitfalls, some of the uh, undesired outcome of those uh, legislation that we need to really guard against? And again, understanding particularly coming from the adaptation perspective that uh, the sectors have various sectoral legislations that governs them. What are some of the difficulties that are common when you are bringing along a new law that aim to serve as an overarching loss, because it might mean that the sectors needs to do a lot of amendments, which might fall outside the purview of a national department that is leading the development of that particular legislation. And this is just a general uh, question. Yes, I think this question things. actually might benefit from uh, reflections from uh, the whole panel, so we'll leave that to all of you. Um, in, other requests for the floor now? Do we have one here, Daniel? Yes. Thank you very much. Simon Milnes from Georgetown Climate Center in the US. Uh, a question I, I think mainly aimed at Maria and Stephen. Will there be scope in the new uh, toolkit to consider uh, subnational laws? Because certainly in the United States, much of the progress has been made at subnational level, including renewable portfolio standards and, and so on. And uh, and I'm also thinking of Scotland. In fact, <laughs> will will that count as a? Will there be an entry for Scotland, for example, in in the toolkit? Um, relatedly, what about constitutions as part of the legal context? Yes, we have you know Islamic law, uh, common law, civil law, and so on. But there are also a number of constitutions which set up an environmental right or standard. Thank you very much. And dare I say, let's hope that Scotland stays subnational or... <laughs> Sorry, that, that was a bad joke. <laughs> let's uh, gather more. Um, you have... Hello, my name is Christina Vogt from Norway. Um, I'm, I'm a little late. I, I didn't get all the presentations, but I have a question to the um, parameters that we have in the Paris Agreement determining the level of ambition of, of national laws. And I'm particularly interested in the Peruvian uh, new climate law. I yes, NDCs are supposed to be nationally determined, but that's not all what the Paris Agreement says. In Article 4.3, it says that the NDC shall, shall each party's NDC uh, uh, will reflect uh, its highest possible ambition and we've always wondered how is that informing countries parties uh, design of domestic uh, legislation we have one in the back uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity um, my question um, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think the the tools are likely to be of very good use uh, to us. Um, sorry, my name is Cecilia Gidaiga, and uh, I am affiliated to the Institute for Advanced Sustainability <coughs> Studies in Germany. Um, so my, my uh, question is uh, whether uh, we have a plan for rolling out or um, bringing this tool to uh, governments, uh, considering that now we are talking about managing some change that is supposed to help us advance our legislative frameworks. Thank you very much. And uh, please don't hesitate if you wanted to share something from yourself. It doesn't need to be a question. Uh, so I invite also anyone that would want to share a reflection uh, and, and or observation. It's also, we're also open for that. What we could do uh, is uh, is now turn to the panel and uh, give you some more time to uh, reflect. And so if I could invite the panel to respond to, to the questions that have come. And if I could just start 
from Rosa and then go across here. And uh, let's, let, let's try to be very succinct so we can go to another round. Rosa? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Jorge. Um, it, this is a very good question, actually. Um, we think that um, the climate law that we might have, have uh, hopefully, soon, um, it's kind of a translation, you know, because um, and, and this we were discussing this morning within our group, ILAC, right? And I was arguing that sometimes when you come to, to the implementation of the Paris Agreement and you have to speak to the health sector, to the energy sector, to the transportation, you come with this international uh, instrument and they have not ever been in this process. They have not ever been including climate change into their planning, into their view, into you know their budgeting exercises, uh, and it is sometimes very difficult to explain why is it um, that this is um, good for for the world, for our country, for our people. <clears throat> Um, also, the law that we are proposing is a framework law, which means that we have to make more specific implementing regulation, right, um, uh, for, for this to, to help um, uh, the work uh, for the implementation of the Paris Agreement specifically. And there's an example that comes with the MRB that we need and the transparency framework that we uh, 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 built in the in the Paris Agreement. This is something very new, and it needs also to be built uh, upon what the country already has as systems, different systems that were built for other purposes. How can this help build at the end of the day the the transparency, uh, the transparency framework, for instance, um, <clears throat> and other instruments. For example, we have in Peru, um, as at many other countries for sure, um, their um, budgeting uh, systems. How is it that climate change comes at, uh, uh, and, and, and is included in the planning of public investments? or the public-private um, uh, partnerships, or we have, um, we call it um, taxes per um, um, kind of in investment, right? So all these instruments, how can they, they be used uh, for these purposes? And uh, regarding uh, Christina's um, question, I, I really didn't understood it very well, <clears throat> um, but Haldor explained it to me. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, uh, I understand that your question relates to how is it that the global ambition or um, the main goal of the Paris Agreement is reflected in in our in our legislation, or maybe we can speak about this afterwards, but. Um, and I think uh, the, the, the answer to this is related to my previous answer. We are trying to translate in national terms what the Paris Agreement means to Peru. And um, when we explained it, we explained it also as um, the, precisely the contribution that Peru has to do to the global effort. And, and um, as you might understand, as many other developing countries, when we speak of this, there, there are a lot of arguments, national arguments, that say that Peru is a very small emitter. Why should we worry um, on, on issues on mitigation, for example? And what we say is that even when we only he worked on adaptation for all the centuries to come that will not be enough because the emissions are still there. So the effort that everyone has to do in terms of uh, mitigation is something that we cannot um, avoid. No? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Rosa. And I, I wonder in terms of vocabulary, maybe uh, uh, the experts on my right that know all this better than I do, I wonder if I could just, uh, because you referred both to laws, uh, policies, and instruments. And uh, I think it might be good to maybe perhaps clarify this, because uh, uh, there are instruments that I assume really need very specific legal foundation. Uh, so I think it might be actually helpful, because in for many cases, uh, People are, um, countries are actually looking at missions trading or other things that really require uh, a, a good foundation or even um, revenue generating uh, instruments. And so I, I just wanted to kind of, uh, if we could maybe uh, elucidate that. But Martin, do you want to reflect on some of it or respond? Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Aldo. Let me uh, try to answer the question I thought I understood uh, posed by the uh, Guatemalan participant. Uh, I think he w was asking me wh uh, what is needed to trigger parliamentary action in implementation of pa uh, Paris. I, I think that one of the very first things that Paris required uh, countries to do was to ratify. Mm -hmm. And in many jurisdictions, actually in most jurisdictions, it is parliament that has that power to ratify uh, the international treaties. And when you look at the speed at which yeah. Paris was uh, ratified, then you can see evidence that parliaments have been busy. They've been walking the talk. So yes. ratification is important. And now it supposes that when you ratify, you have read through the uh, treaty and you know what is in there and what is required of you to follow up on that in terms of legislation. So uh, there's that trigger there that is built into the uh, ratification process. But then you also have in many systems uh, mechanisms that have been put in place, for instance, to assess the impact of uh, future legislation on certain aspects of society, be it uh, gender, be it uh, uh, the environment, uh, climate. So this is another thing that we want to push for that is to make sure that whatever legislation is coming out of uh, Parliament has been informed by that assessment from the, uh, through the prism of climate change. How does this legislation, even if it doesn't deal with uh, climate change per se, how does it impact positively or negatively on climate change? Something that we need to do. And then uh, when I made my introductory remarks, I talked about outreach to civil society civil society often plays that strong role of watchdog. They're there to ensure accountability. They have read through the Paris Agreement, seen the fine print, and they can uh, detect gaps that they can bring to the attention of parliaments and parliamentarians for them uh, to take action on. So these are some of the uh, triggers. And very quickly, there was that question from the lady at the back of the room about the uh, whether or not these tools that we have been talking about will be brought to the attention of governments. I would like to uh, say, if you mean gov, uh, well, if you say government, you mean uh, parliament and executive, then I, that's fine. But if not, let me correct that it is important, as I said, that parliament also be at the entry point because at the end of the day, they are responsible for legislation. As far as the IP is concerned, we are going to make sure that these tools that we are developing will be disseminated to parliamentarians because it's, it's part of the uh, knowledge building uh, exercise. We are going to make sure, and that is our strategy in the IPU, to take the Paris Agreement and see how this can be mainstreamed throughout parliamentary processes in countries. Uh, mm -hmm. That is one thing that we need to do. And then lastly, uh, this should be part of the uh, capacity building efforts that we're doing, the technical assistance that we provide to Parliament well, uh, worldwide, that uh, when you develop these tools, they should be used to boost the efficiency of capacity building. Thank you. Yes, and I, one one comment here, I think, I'm, I'm sure that as you do that, uh, as you mobilize parliamentarians' interest, um, uh, you would also be speaking to those that are primarily interested, for example, in energy policy. Because, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, one thing that uh, maybe the, our experts can also elaborate on is the, the difference here with the Paris Agreement. When you were talking about the ratification step, uh, it's not immediately obvious, for example, to a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
precisely what legislation is required. Uh, if you compare this to if you ratify, for example, the CITES convention, it's clear that you need uh, legislation that allows you to stop uh, people at the border uh, with uh, with illegal um, uh, articles. So the, the path from from ratification to domestic legislation is is actually more complex because this is a much deeper agreement. It's an agreement that really touches quite deep into uh, um, and so I will now continue and and. Uh, um, thank you. So I firstly would comment on Rosa's um, uh, questions and comments. Um, so on, on the scope, so different countries have different uh, legislative and policy making culture and uh, some initiate action in the parliament and take legislative route while others focus more at this point on executive action. And when we designed the tool, we thought that we should try and capture both of those. Um, to have a comprehensive resource, but there is an opportunity um, just to highlight the legislation. Uh, so, and and then the database will give you only entries which are laws in the strict definition as being re initiated by by the parliament. So, our, our resource allows you to do both: look at executive um, action and at uh, legislation. And we also track specifically framework legislation of the type that Rosa has referred to. Peru is looking at the overarching law or executive policy which gives a direction to climate change action. Um, on the question about climate related, um, again, our database uh, tracks those laws and executive policies which uh, have climate change as their specific and explicit objective and those can be delineated and extracted from the database. But we also felt that it's important to, to track actions uh, in uh, related sectors which aim to facilitate low carbon transition but may not be part of the climate change law explicitly. Therefore, we tracked also energy efficiency, renewable energy laws and um, land use change laws and so on. So um, our resource allows you to go narrow or wide depending on what your needs are. On Christina's question in terms of national ambition and how to ensure that it's not just translating the level of NDC but actually going for the ratchet and for the maximum. Uh, we, uh, for the study for Marrakesh conference in November, we have looked at G20 countries and assessed whether the targets in the NDC level corresponded to what's already in the national legislation executive policy and we found that 13 out of G20 countries actually need to do work to bring the national legislation policy up to the level of what NDCs have promised to do. And then, of course, there is a question of how do we go beyond that. And one example of how you to do, can do this is, I think, the UK's policy infrastructure, where you have an independent climate change committee who aims to provide um, independent scientific and socioeconomic advice to the government precisely to identify can you go beyond and what are the implications. And also the UK system of carbon budgets which provide for regularized, very clear and time ratchet. And that model is one example that we know of that might be very compatible with what Paris Agreement asks us to do. And finally, in terms of pitfalls, I think you and environment colleagues might, might have more examples, but I think from my experience, one area is inconsistencies potentially um, between laws and policies in different areas. And that's part of the reason why we thought we need to go wider than just tracking the climate change legislation specifically. For example, having fossil fuel subsidies would obviously contradict uh, some of the objectives of the low carbon legislation and so on. So just provide one, I'll stop there. Maria? Thank you. So just like uh, the presentation, Stephen and I will divide up the questions. So first on Rosa's point about how she wished this tool was available when uh, in, in uh, earlier, I think even for countries that already have legislation, we are hoping that the tool will still be helpful because, for example, if there is framework legislation, there might be the need to look at sectoral laws and, and hopefully the tool also assists in reviewing existing legislation so that if a country wanted to see what resources are out there to help them review the laws and um, to revise and, and strengthen the laws, the toolkit will also help in that. On Haldor's question of law 
and policy and instruments. I think Alina referred to that already, but we'd like to emphasize that a deliberate choice was made for the toolkit to focus on law for several reasons. One is that we think that law locks in policy and promotes certainty and a certain direction, uh, which is good overall and also for investment. Um, and there are certain things that only law can do. For example, it is mainly through law that institutions are created or the mechanisms for coordination are defined. And as Martin also said, usually budgetary allocations are provided through the law. And we know that in the case of NDCs and um, climate implementation, that is a very important um, factor. And then on the question of the rollout, um, one thing I also wanted to emphasize, while we are trying to develop the toolkit, we are also working directly with particular countries that have requested our assistance. So both the Commonwealth Secretariat and UN Environment are actually now in discussion and working with particular countries that have asked for our assistance in either reviewing the legislation that they have or formulating new laws. And so we are also hoping that we can get feedback from this country, these countries and also refine the design of the toolkit through this on the ground experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, firstly, just on the, the question of subnational laws, I think absolutely the, the ultimate aim of the toolkit would be to cover um, all legislation that is relevant to achievement of, of climate goals under Paris. And of course, um, in many countries, that is um, very important at subnational level. I think it may be overly ambitious for us although we will increase our level of ambition, um, to to deal with that in the first um, stage of the toolkit. So probably we'll start with national laws and then go um, down to subnational. Constitutions would certainly be included and um, within the sort of cluster of overarching climate change laws and governance, constitutions would be important. There's one or two countries in Northern Africa, for example, that specifically have constitutional climate change um, provisions. Um, so we would certainly look to include those. Um, I was very intrigued to hear the, the, the question from South Africa concerning um, adaptation and the challenges around sectoral legislation. Uh, and we certainly see a lot of challenges around that. And I think one of the biggest is coordination. If you think um, of a challenge that many small developing countries, uh, many Commonwealth countries face, for example, such as salination of water aquifers due to rising sea levels, um, from a legislative perspective, it engages many, many issues, not only planning around access to water, um, but water use and reuse in agriculture um, as a public health matter, uh, whether there's legislation on water quality standards or not. And normally legislation is made by a line ministry developing a policy proposal and then pushing that through the Attorney General's office and through to, to parliaments. But of course, when um, a single issue um, like that has many implications, and then there is really a need for um, often uh, a body such as a National Climate Change Coordinating Committee to have the discussion between the line ministries as to the different um, interests that they have um, with respect to ensuring uh, that that issue is dealt with. So certainly we see coordination around adaptation issues um, as, as a key area to be looked at. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's it's you please. Uh, we we um, have one more question here, and then I, we actually need to um, uh, conclude. Please, you uh, I'm not a question. Uh, I'm a clarification. My name is Michal Nachmani. I'm from the Grantham Institute. I've been working on the uh, climate laws change uh, climate change laws of the world database since 2013. Um, so I want to add a couple of things on this. First of all, to the question on constitutions. Um, to the extent that constitutions uh, globally address climate change explicitly and transitions to low carbon, we do capture them in our database. There's a handful of countries and a handful of laws in the database which uh, are constitutions. On subnational, this is one of the things that we are very keen to do. Uh, the US is one of the examples. Canada is another one of the examples that until recently, uh, its climate change uh, action has been mainly on the subnational level. Recently, Canada's upped its game, and we're very happy to see that. Um, and we are very keen to expand our um, cooperation with US-based bodies and with Canadian bodies in order to uh, dive deeply into the subnational level. This is one of the goals rather than one of the present uh, uh, achievements. Thank you all very much. Uh, I mean, it's quite clear that uh, this idea from Patricia to actually bring some of these insights into here uh, was a, a good idea. 
I appreciate very much uh, uh, our partners coming here and, and, and making those presentations. It was very helpful to have uh, uh, the, the parliamentary perspective, and I know there are people in the audience that are working with, uh, with parliamentarians. And it's so great to see Rosa again uh, working at home, making things happen. Uh, uh, so uh, this conversation is, is, is definitely going to continue. But try, let's make a target for ourselves now. Let's advance this conversation significantly in the next six months. And, and let's see where we are uh, when we gather here again in, in Bonn in, in November for COP23. Because there's a lot of opportunities to actually um, uh, exchange on this. Uh, and there will be um, um, parliamentarians coming. Uh, there will be uh, a broader community of the general practitioners. Uh, our host country, Germany, is, is uh, putting it up a lot of effort to actually being able to accommodate a lot of conversations. So there will be a lot of activity around the COP uh, in, in, in November. But let's make sure that when we, when we meet again and talk about this again, that we have actually advanced. We will have more countries that uh, are in a position to share. But because we are really, this is all about systematic learning. Uh, this is, we're breaking new ground. Uh, many of those things uh, are, the nature of it is different from what we've done before, but it's also a very exciting area when you break new ground. And so thanks for coming. Uh, thanks to the presenters and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks.